I just wanted to see if we can get a, a group shot here just by spot. the base of this tree. And then we're going to go to see the last couple of trees before heading up. So can we just get a quick group shot by the bottom of the tree? Yeah, if you're on the on this side you need to come in just a team but oh, I just sat down I know. <laughs> These are also known as jumping front there. Why don't you there? just back up if you can't get us all in? Yeah, I don't really want to go right <laughs> there. <laughs> I, found, I found the perch. Oh. All right, one, two, three, say trees. Trees! That's great. That is an unbelievable group. Wow. Yeah. One more. We know you're a good photographer. Yeah. Class of 2012. <laughs> Well, and I've got one more in my pocket here. This is so, high high tech. Yeah, where's, where's your real camera? This is for Twitter. That's DJ's main camera. <laughs> it actually is incredible. Can you make an Instagram. You you guess pulled it right on my hand. Okay. Whoa. Left it on vehiculum. Yeah. <laughs> one, two, three. Beautiful. <laughs> Even made a realistic sound. That's awesome. All good, guys. It's definitely one of the more spectacular ones. <laughs> I plan to move there though within like a few months. <laughs> Somebody stepped on it, I think. Oh, that's why. Because they're in here tourists, because I saw it on the trail and it was all slimy. Oh, yeah. So what is it? A banana slug. It's a rotten <laughs> banana slug. <'cause> it's no. <laughs> I feel bad for it. They sure are picking up. Can you know if they're going to make you. Like, so many views have grown up. I've never seen anything like that in my life. It looks like this one's being stripped too, Pamela. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, there's a spider. It's going to grow like this. <laughs> You should see the pattern in the bark here. It's got all the, the curves in it. It's pretty neat looking. Yeah. Perfectly symmetrical. I'm not sure. Another mystery. Here? Huge mushroom. Huge mushroom. Oh, skeleton. Skeleton? I guess that's just the way cedars are. Yeah, that's why each one's, each one's very different than you. Yeah, when they pull up. There's a little hole going down here. But maybe he was in this. Yeah, maybe. But pretending there's a hole. Yeah, one night. Yeah, one night. Yeah, one night. Getting only one night. Definitely. Cute. <laughs> Neville here will tell you about new species in the old growth forest, like in these uh, cedars, the latest research, I guess, or variety of. Okay, so as you've been walking through this grove, uh, you've probably had a chance to look at the tops of these trees. And so you can take, cedar is probably the best example, and they bifurcate, or it's called candelabra. Yeah. And so where the candelabra creates sort of a V, if you want, and does this on the branches, etc. And debris and soil and moss accumulates. And this is the big thing that with Kevin, uh, 
who really heads up our climbing team that we found in the early 90s that in these ancient forests there's a suspended community that's discrete, so a suspended soil community. And in the world of science that was big news because of course as we all now know that unique habitat which is only found there had new species galore. And you know just two weeks ago in the Times calling us, Brian Starmoski who's at UVic heading on um, BC's biodiversity and why we need more protected areas etc. And you know, went through all the mega vertebrates, but the stuff we work on is invertebrates, or the insects and that, and he said, oh, and by the way, there's an estimated 35,000 species of insects in BC. Well, that 35,000 came from the work that we did uh, on the top, in the tops of these trees and did the extrapolation from there. So, again, it's the same thing, structural integrity you don't find, as we've said, in smaller trees, and you do in these sort of really large old trees. And getting to the tops of these trees is something certainly that Kevin's an expert uh, at, and, and uh, you just don't sort of go out there and start climbing from the bottom. All right, so maybe Kevin will explain a little bit about what we call simple rope techniques. The canopy community, which I'd say is about 60 or 70 people worldwide, um, does this. We go to these different ancient forests, climb to the tops of these trees, and it's the same story a separate suspended canopy system. And what's unique, everybody always thought it was just the tropics. But it's not, it's right here in your backyard. And that's the important thing. And so I think Kevin and a few others have developed the skills that allow people like me to safely get to the tops of these trees. Because, you know, as everybody knows, I hate heights. Which is not <laughs> the thing, but it did it to sort of, you know, let's, a naive student, let's protect the forest. That's the way I started. So, Kevin, if you want to just say a few words about how to get up to the tops of these trees. Yeah. Um you do start from the bottom. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's often the best way. But uh, basically, for, uh, seeming we're climbing for research and uh, not from an industry point of view, we don't go with the spikes, uh, which is the traditional way from an industry point of view where they'd climb to top tall trees before bringing them down. They would use these spurs on shoes, a big belt around the tree, go up puncturing the trunk as they go up. Um, that's very injurious to the tree, it opens it up to various pathogens and insect festations and whatnot. So uh, if we uh, came up with a, a single rope technique it's called and basically we get a rope up into the tree. Uh, so to do that typically it's uh, a method of firing up uh, a weighted arrow either on a longbow or a crossbow and we, with those uh, devices you can shoot limbs that are sometimes you know 60 70 meters high which is important in certain species of tree when that's the lowest limb mm -hmm. so you're looking for a, a limb that's going to support you uh, you never preferably really know more than one <laughs> yeah preferably more than one that's so there's a backup one under there and then you so you shoot up a fishing line with the weighted arrow goes up and over a limb comes back down you then tie onto that uh, some smaller cord, <coughs> reel back in your fishing line, and the cord's now up and over. You then tie on a, about a nine millimeter uh, climbing rope, drag that up and over, over the limb, anchor it off around something, and then ascend that rope using various devices that are out there. Uh, then when you get into the canopy, you can sometimes still be a ways from the top. So then you work your way up on a series of uh, smaller lengths of rope that you throw up and over with a weighted bag on over limbs and <laughs> climb up that way or climb from limb to limb just anchoring yourself in and then typically working up there we just use a series of ropes uh, and hang ourselves uh, not from the neck but from our <laughs> harness uh, and work around up there and then <laughs> rappel down it's um, each tree is different each tree is unique it's a uh, it's very humbling a profession to be in because uh, you're going in you know at times uh, 800 1200 year old plants you know when you think about it they're just plants and you're a human climbing this plant and no humans ever been up there before <laughs> and so it's very humbling to be in a living creature that's experienced all that amount of life and you know you're really sometimes uh, putting your life in their hands to hold on to you when you're up there <laughs> and then you see up there as Neville said uh, a whole range of uh, stratification but also incredible stuff too as well as all these suspended soils that are sometimes in some of the crooks you know up to three feet deep that's accumulated from debris falling from above that's taken hundreds if not thousands of years to accumulate that soil um, up there even on this one 
you can see there's a huckleberry growing up there. So, you know, you can be up there and have a picnic at times. <laughs> on uh, the big Sitka spruce limbs, you can have a good sleep. They're about this wide, the moss mats, and they extend out for 15 feet. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a whole other world up there. And you see when you're up there that the forest does have an order to it. Often down here it looks quite jumbled and you look up and it all looks sort of a bit messy. When you get up into the canopy, you actually see that the trees have worked out how to live with each other. They all sort of have what's called a, a crown shyness. They all take their own space and there, there's an order to it. It's like a lace work. It all interlaps to each other. It's a, a very different perspective and it's a, really quite fascinating and I encourage you to get up a tree one time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll all be climbing, climbing this tree yeah, after you. <laughs> <laughs> what about coming down? Coming down. Uh, Depends if you find hornets first. <laughs> yeah. You just repel <laughs> down on the rope. Oh, we repel down. Yeah, you, you, you repel down on the rope. Uh, sometimes, um, as Darren said, you know, you encounter big hornets nests up there and you come down, down a hell of a lot quicker <laughs> than you expect. And, uh, you know, in uh, some of the work in the interior BC, you know, you can even uh, encounter uh, bear dens part way up in the cottonwoods wow. and that, which gets you down quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> There's some neat use by forest floor animals on these trees. There's not very many of them that will take the time to sort of go up the whole tree. But interesting, some of the earlier work that we did, so everybody's probably familiar with the deer mouse or pyramiscus <laughs> maniculatus. So these little deer mouse, so on the ground we ear tag them because Earlier on, we thought that, well, what are these droppings, what, you know, 30 to 40 meters up in this tree? So we caught pyramiscus on the ground, ear tagged them, and lo and behold, those same individuals that we ear tagged, we found up in the canopy. So it was like using this barrel shaped sort of sick of spruce as a highway, if you want. So there's lots of those interactions that still need to be explored. Not much else has been done on, quote, small mammals, especially rodents, um, in these forest settings. And so that's the other benefit of, of these big, large trees is what they provide in terms of habitat for ground dwellers. But look how much it's changed basic things like climate. I mean, we can all here now say it's a lot colder than it is out on the road and always has been. It's moister. So all those what they call abiotic features, all the climate features, if you want, really dictate um, sort of plants and animals and insects that, that are certainly here. And that changes markedly when you take these big trees out. And it takes a long time for the system to get back. And as Claudia said earlier, you know, a lot of the logging commences again, um, if that's what we're talking about, in less than 130 years, for sure, generally around the 80 year mark. So you can see the succession, if you want, it's totally changed. And as Kevin said, thousands of years to get these systems in place. And I think that's certainly worth uh, making an effort to sort of protect oh, yeah. on it for sure. And that's what Ken and TJ, are, of course, are involved in. Yeah. So does anybody have any questions at all? No, not. We can't get you up to the tree right now, but, <laughs> you know. It's something to keep your eye on. And like I say, the big thing that's really taken off, too, globally, is accessing canopies. Mm -hmm. And so putting platforms, it's nothing that we've done here yet. But Kevin's been involved in other projects, and I've been to other areas where they actually put in canopy walkways. They're probably heard about them in National Geographic and whatever, where you can actually give people the experience of being up in the canopy, and it's totally different. Mm -hmm. You just, get, as Kevin said, appreciate the forest by having a good look at how it's sort of patterned out over a larger sort of spatial scale. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think Ken wanted to talk about, which I'm not an expert on, Darren probably knows more about this than I do, but the sort of ecosystem, if you want, this large scale interaction, we can take a look at, at, at elk, and there's, a, there's sort of an elk, wolf, cougar, there's this sort of triangle, I call it, I, I teach this to my students, in that really a lot of the prey items, such as elk and that, um, really need these types of, of force. If you push all of that prey item, elk in this particular case, into sort of second growth areas, and there's a really, really hard winter, well, they're all going to accumulate in there, they're not going to do that well, and their transport of nutrients from salmon streams into the forest, and then what that did in terms of the plants and animals associated with that. So we can take cores out of trees and actually see that nutrient in, the nutrient pulse that comes from salmon being deposited in, in the uh, in the forest. So wow. you're right, as soon as you break that link, I could be overfishing, I don't know what it is, it could be, then there might be a problem. And the biggest player on the block for all of us, um, and that's everyone, is certainly, quote, climate change. Mm -hmm. Whether you believe it or not, if things change, you can imagine we might lock an area aside, and if the climate changes, then the very things that you want 
to, to you know maintain in that area might be in trouble especially if it's not connected and i think that that's the thing is to have these this protected area strategy which is like an ecosystem strategy which is, i think is what you guys are, are are looking at pretty closely which we've tried to fight for for yeah, yeah. forever yeah, we like thought... we'll see in the future <laughs>